morning kicks off a very exciting week for us. Uh, we have an entire busload of kids, young people from uh, Fried Hardeman. Uh, so today starts our lectureship and our BBS. Of course, that's starting tomorrow morning. Um, we were going to have a split class this morning, if you remember. We are all going to be in here. We were going to be divided up men and women. Brother Jonathan is going to teach our Bible class here this morning for us all. His lovely wife was going to be with us and uh, have a class for you ladies this morning. That did not work. Her father is about to have surgery, as I understand it, and so she did not make the trip. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Jonathan. He has served as a minister of the gospel for 17 years, uh, doing local work with congregations in Oklahoma and New Mexico in various capacities, including campus minister, pulpit minister, and family minister. Jonathan has a passion for discipleship, and missions. He has done mission work in six countries on two different continents and is currently serving as the instructor and coordinator for the Ghana and Togo with the World Bible Institute. His Bachelor of Arts in Theology from Bear Valley Bible Institute of Denver has a Master of Arts in Christian Scripture from Heritage Christian University. He has been married to his lovely wife, uh, his beautiful wife, Lacey, for 23 years. They have been blessed with four children, uh, Riel, Ariana, Maya, and ja, uh, Jathan. Jathan is staying with us. Maya is in a children's classroom back there. Uh, so, he, so he has two children that made the trip with us. Um, Jason is in the seventh grade, correct? Yeah. And so uh, we're, we're really happy to have not only Jonathan and, and his two of his children, uh, but this entire group with us this week. And we're going to start with a word of prayer, and then we'll turn it over to John. Would you bow with me? Our God in heaven, we thank you so much for the safe journey you've afforded us in coming here this morning. We thank you for another opportunity, dear Lord, to look into your letter to us, for an opportunity to glean from Scripture the things that you would have us to know. We pray, dear Lord, that you would ever make us good Bible students of your word. We pray that you would bless Jonathan this morning as he brings us a message. We pray that you would be with all the activities that are going on this week. We pray that they might be not only uh, inspirational and uplifting to each and every one of us, but ultimately, dear Lord, that your name would be praised. We thank you so much for the blessings that you continue to shower upon us, and we ask you to be with us all throughout this hour of study and the next of worship. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad to be here with you during this Bible class time. Um, I'm not sure exactly... Uh, how much participation that you're used to giving, uh, but I'm going to maybe uh, stretch you a little bit if you're not used to talking much, because uh, I like to I like to have interaction in Bible class. So I'm going to just set that standard out there before us now. I want to start, begin this morning uh, by saying thank you very much for the opportunity to be here to participate in this uh, event and this uh, this lectureship. All the things it's so wonderful for me to travel and meet different brothers and sisters all across. Uh, this country and other countries as well. I always enjoy it. So I'm looking forward not only to get to speak and, and teach this morning, but also to get to know you. So uh, let's make sure we make some time to do that. I, I believe it's important for us to establish connections and fellowship wherever we go. So I wanted to begin this morning by asking you a question. Uh, what is this? Bible. Bible. Can we be more specific? It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God, right? Very good. Is it one book? Many books? How many? All right, we're getting there. Okay, good. Y'all start. Okay, good. Sixty-six books. How many stories? One overarching story. How does that work? How, how many years to write the Bible? Fifty-five. Yeah. What, 66 books over a span of about approximately 1,500 years, and yet it tells one story. How does that work? It's inspired. Okay, there you go. All right, there. That's that. It's inspired, right? That's an important thing for us to think about, right? If we have a, a, one overarching story that spans a time frame of 1,500 years, we need to be able to explain that. And so one of the things that I want us to think about this morning is kind of the theme that we've been talking about is the, the prophecies of Jesus. 
right? Prophecy is a very important concept when it talks about and understanding the unity of the scriptures. Without it, we're going to struggle. We're going to struggle to be able to explain how all of these 66 books that come over the span of 1,500 years all come together. If we don't understand prophecy, we're going to fall, that's going to fall apart for us. And so I want us to begin by, by understanding a little bit about this idea. When we talk about the idea of prophecy, what are we saying? Foretelling the future. Okay, all right. So prophecy, right? One, one way prophecy is used is the idea of telling the future. That's going to be the one that's most significant for us. Right? Very good. There is another sense in which prophecy is used in the Bible. Does anybody know what that one is? Message from God. Yeah. That, that's a message from God, right? Uh, a lot of the, the prophecies that we will read were given uh, to a specific group of people during a specific time, but they were also predicting some things that would happen in the future, right? And so we need to understand that, that prophecy in the Bible is both a foretelling to a group of people where it's given in a specific context. And it is also many times in addition to that, a foretelling in which it extends down the, the avenue of time uh, to a future distant time, uh, and it's specifically to a specific individual in the life and the, the events of that person, right? Who's that person? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, right? Well, so when we talk about the Bible, when we talk about one overarching story, it's his story. This is the Holy Word of God that's inspired by the Holy Spirit that tells us the story of Jesus Christ, his son, God's son. And it tells us about all the different aspects of his life, his birth, his incarnation, his, his life, his, his death, his burial, his resurrection. There's so much that comes in the form of, of prophecy in this word. And so I want us to really begin to appreciate that concept as, as we're going to go through the various lessons that you're going to hear uh, in the different topics and classes. And I just want you to understand what we're dealing with and when we talk about the idea of prophecy. So I want us to start, uh, as we always like to start, in the beginning. Let's start back there. When, when do you think, it may, probably a lot of you have already heard some of this, so I'm not going to belabor some of this too much, but when is the very first prophecy that you can think of in regards to Jesus Christ? The prophet ruling the first field. There you go, all right, yeah, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, we're going to turn there. Uh, if you just kind of remember, catch up on our context here. Um, Adam and Eve, they've been in the garden. They were told not to eat of the tree that's in the middle of the garden. The serpent comes and deceives Eve. She eats. She gives to Adam, who, who is with her. He eats. And then God comes in and they hide, right? And they hide themselves. And then God says, hey, you know, why were you hiding? Well, we were naked. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat of that tree? Well, yes. Yes, we did, right? He says, Adam, what have you done? Adam said, it's, God is it's Eve, the woman you gave me. She's the one that did it. He says, Eve, what did you do? And she says, well, the serpent tricked me. And so in Genesis chapter 3, we're going to pick up just a little bit here. Uh, when he is talking uh, to Eve, uh, he says, uh, uh, well, actually, let's talk about with the serpent. Let's talk about that. Verse 14 there. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and above the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise uh, your, your head, and you shall bruise his heel. All right. And so Jesus here, what do we learn about Jesus through this prophecy? Let's, let's talk about that real quick. Okay, ultimately he will defeat Satan. Very good. Okay. We also learn that he's going to be what? Yeah, seed of woman. He's going to be a human. He's going to come in human form. 
to do this. Right? I'm going to put enmity between your offspring and her offspring, right? There's going to be this struggle, this fight that goes on, right? Okay, very good. All right. Something I want to know. Yes, sir. The location of the cell. Okay, yes, very good. All right, yeah. Explain what you mean by that. So the head is a lot more important than the ear. Obviously, they all have a purpose, but it's the head has the brain. And because of that, being bruised on the head, it's like it's like kicking almost kick, kicking a baseball bat to the head or kicking a baseball bat to the other. You know, which one would you rather prefer? You know, it's it's, it's the, the intensity of the bruise. Okay, very good. Yes, he's bringing up a very good point. Now, just to answer your question, my preference would be neither. I don't want a baseball bat either way. But here we go. But here's the idea. He's bringing up a very valid point. Right? Satan is going to bruise his heel. Right? The serpent going to bruise his heel, and he's going to crush Satan's head, the serpent's head, right? And so if you're going to have an injury, you would rather have a, an injury to your heel than to your head, right? That's right. One of them is a death blow. One of them says you're completely done, right? One of them just is an inconvenience. It's something that can be overcome. Okay, and so that's very good, very important for us to know. All right, very good. So as we continue forward, I want to look at just a couple other prophecies concerning the birth of Jesus, because that's that's the my, my area for this morning. We're going to be looking at the birth of Jesus. I want to talk, look at one maybe that we don't know uh, as well. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 9. This has been moving forward in time a little bit, right? Uh, we've had corruption increasing upon the earth. Uh, God has uh, told Noah to build the ark, sent the flood. This is after that time has taken place. Uh, Noah has overindulged himself, and uh, there's some incidents that happened with his uh, sons. And if we're picking up in Genesis chapter 9, I want us to look and start in verse 24, but I want us to focus on verses 26 and 27. It says, When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew that his youngest uh, knew what his youngest son had done to him. He said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. And he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And may God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. All right. A couple things I want us to think about with this text. Who is it that's cursed? Canaan. Who is Canaan? <coughs> Son of Ham. Very good. Okay, very good. Somebody said that. Good. All right. Okay. So, what, why did, who, who committed the wrong? Ham did. So why is Canaan the one that's cursed? That's right. We're talking about bloodlines. Very good. All right. Okay. Notice then how he speaks about the other two sons. What do you notice and what is different? Canaanites, right? It's not, that, that was pretty easy, right? So we, we know there's going to be some struggles down the road, so very good. All right, good. What else do we see? How does he talk about Japheth? Blesses him as well. Yeah, he says, hey, make his tent large, right? How does he talk about Shem? Give him the highest blessing. Is Shem given a blessing? Hmm. Who's blessed in that passage? 
the Lord. Now wait a minute, what is going on? This is, a, this is one of those kind of cool passages that sometimes we skip over when we're talking about the idea of Jesus being born, right? Uh, a lot of, when you look at this and you slow down and you study this, a lot of people consider this one of the first messianic kind of prophecies after Genesis 3. Uh, this talks about uh, kind of the first indication of the bloodline of the Messiah, right? Uh, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Shem is elevated, right? And there's this connection because in the birth order, where is Shem? Is he first? He's second, right? But he's elevated through this blessing, okay? And he's saying the Messiah, basically, God is going to come through Shem's line. What's interesting when you really look at this and you study this, is that a lot of our ancient literature has just a little bit different understanding of this ver of these verses, right? It says, there's an Aramaic uh, paraphrase of this verse, and it says, He shall make his Shekinah to dwell in the tabernacles of Shem. What is a Shekinah? That's the phrase that means God's presence, Right? Uh, about, according to the Babylonian Talmud, they say it this way, although God has enlarged Japheth, the divine presence rests only in the tents of Shem. The divine presence rests in his household, in his line. Right? A lot of Jewish interpreters actually understood this to be uh, this idea of, of God resting in there. According to Targum on the, on the Kelos, it says, he shall make his Shekinah dwell in the tabernacles of Shem. Uh, other Jewish sources agree with this. God shall dwell within the tabernacles of Shem. And so what I want us to understand is that there's this idea that is wrapped up in here. Sometimes I think maybe we don't catch because we're reading the English. That a lot of Hebrew readers said, hey, there's something going on here. Right? This, is, this is more than God... What our English translations might say to us that God that He's blessing the God of Shem. No, He's asking God to dwell with Shem. Right? He's asking God to make His home with Shem. And so, what's interesting about that is down in Shem's line, what happens? Just not too far from this, in the Book of Exodus, who 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 descends from Shem? Let's ask it that way. The Hebrews. What happens in the book of Exodus? All right, they are freed from, from Egyptian slavery, and then what? What do they go do? What do they build? Who dwells in the tabernacle? That's where the presence of God dwells, right? And so we see this being talked about here, and we see it taking place very quickly, and then ultimately... Is, does, does the dwelling of God end there? Ultimately, how does it come out? Yeah, right? As we move into the New, Te New Testament, the New Covenant, right, that's inaugurated by Jesus, where's the tabernacle? We are. God still dwells amongst his people. All right, so I just want you to see that this is one of those cool things that I think a lot of times we skip over uh, because we're English readers and we're not, we, we kind of miss some of the things that some of the Hebrew readers uh, picked up on. Okay, um, this is probably one, the next one that we see dealing with the birth of Jesus as we move forward is in Genesis chapter 12. All right, we probably know this one. Um, God calls Abram, right? And what does he promise Abram? A son. Okay, promises him a son. What else? Look at Genesis chapter three or chapter twelve and verse verses one through three. Let's look at those. I'm sorry. Land. Land. Okay. A great nation. Yeah, make you into a nation. Good. Bless those who bless you and those who curse you. 
Curse those who curse you. Very good. And then there's this last phrase there. What does that say? All people on earth shall be blessed through you. All people on the earth shall be blessed through you. What is he talking about? How can all the people on the entire earth be blessed through the line of Abraham? Because Jesus will come through his line. Yes, that's right. Jesus comes through his line. Right? And so I want us to see, like, when we're talking about the idea of, of prophecies about the birth of Jesus, all the way from the beginning, it's over and over and over and over again, we see God promising those who are faithful to him that they will be blessed when he comes to dwell with them. That's an amazing thing. Okay? Um, let's see here. Let's look at a little bit, a few other verses down. Uh, let's see. He says there he's going to uh, bless them. He's going to give them the land. We've looked at all that. Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 26. Uh, there's a lot of things that happen in between this, a lot of events that I'm not going to try to summarize because that would take up a lot of time. So if you have some homework, you can go do some reading there. Okay. Uh, but we have this reiteration, this promise of blessing. We pick it up in Genesis chapter 26. Let's look at verses 2 through 5. It says, And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down. We're talking now about Isaac, okay? And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And will give to your offspring these lands, and in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my, obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments and my statutes and my laws. Now, what did he just say would happen through Isaac's offspring? Yeah, numerous as the stars, you're going to get the land, but for our purposes... Yes, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Again, we're talking about Jesus. And so, again, we see that moving down, that whole promise, right? Um, let's look at Genesis chapter 28. Now we've moved past Isaac. We're to the next generation. We're dealing with Jacob. Okay. All right. Let's look at, let's read verses 10 through 14. It says, Jacob left Beersheba and went on to Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down to that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We see this prophecy again. Yet time and time again, God is working. He's telling us what's coming. Right? All right. Um, another probably less known passage, prophecy, I think, that deals with that. As we move forward from Jacob, we go through who's the next big figure in this line in the book of Genesis. Jacob has how many sons? Joseph. Well, right, yeah. One of them gets sold. That's Joseph. That's where we're headed, right? The next big section on the book of, jo uh, of Genesis focuses in on Joseph, one of, of Jacob's <coughs> sons. And Joseph does some amazing things that do not pertain to the birth of Jesus. But he does have something to say that I think is of interest for us. So I want you to open to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49, and I want us to read verses 9 and 10. Okay, here, uh, here uh, Joseph is blessing, Jacob is blessing his sons. Uh, and the, uh, what I want us to focus on is Judah. Uh, this is at the end of Joseph's life. Jacob is there. They're going to carry the bones, all those kinds of things. We're going to deal with a lot, of, a lot of things going on. But notice what he says here to Judah. 
I says, Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion. And as a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not protect the heart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and he shall have the, uh, the obedience of the peoples. Okay, so this is, again, you know, Joseph has risen to power. He's bringing his family there. His dad's dying. Uh, Jacob's dying. And then he's blessing his children during this process. And what does he say about Judah in those verses? What does he say? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. What does that mean? Just they're never going to be without a ruler, someone lording over. Okay. Well, in context, he's going to have power, but right. long term, you can see that differently. Okay, yeah, he's going to have power. He's going to have that rulership, right? Okay, good. All right. Um, one of the interesting things about this, this is one of those verses I think, again, we kind of read over. But if you were a Jewish person, this stands out to you, okay? Um, so, first of all, we see that the, the, the scepter shall not depart. In reference to Jesus, that means that Jesus is going to come from this line, right? Uh, he's going to come from this. We also see a timing in Jesus' coming. How do we know that? What, what is the timing that we see here? So Shiloh comes. Right? Or until the scepter departs. That, that, whole, that whole phrase there, right? Okay. What does Shiloh... Peace. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Now, I want us to look at this, a little, this word Shiloh a little bit in more in depth. Uh, the word Shiloh was something that the Jews would use as another name for the Messiah. You know that. And so when it talks about when Shiloh comes, they understood that to mean until the Messiah comes. Right? Now, uh, when we're talking about this, he says, the scepter, this idea of, of rulership, of authority, I guess, is the way we oftentimes think of it. Um, but there was also an actual scepter that was kept by the leaders of the 12 tribes. And it was one of those things that they would have down there, and it symbolized basically the, the rights and the powers of God's people to them. And as long as they had that, they could govern themselves, they could even administer the death penalty, right? And that's something we see in the law. But according to this prophecy, Christ was to come before that was done away with, before the scepter departed from Judah, right? Right? So when did the Jews lose their national rights and powers? Which time? <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. No, that's a great question. How about the ultimate time when they lost the ability to even administer the death penalty? It was uh, during the Roman... It was. It was during the Roman thing. It was 86. A man named uh, Coponus was installed by the Roman emperor as the first procurator of the, of the Judea area and he is the one that took away the Jews power to administer the death penalty right remember in the, in the New Testament when they want to have Jesus crucified they have to take him to the Romans they don't have that authority anymore and what's interesting about this is when that occurred even the first century Jews recognized that as the departure of the scepter okay um, when the Sanhedrin, members of the Sanhedrin found out that they could not put Jesus to death, uh, they, they, were, they had to take him there. One Jewish teacher, this is Rabbi Rachman, he said, When the members of the Sanhedrin found themselves deprived, deprived of their right over death, a general consternation took possession of them. They covered their heads with ashes, their bodies with sackcloth, exclaiming, Woe to us! For the scepter has departed from Judah and the Messiah has not come. So if you're a first century Jew, 86, and you hear that your right to administer the death penalty is taken away, that's how you react. Woe to us, because the scepter has departed and the Messiah has not come. But he had. They just didn't realize it at the time. 
And so we see a prophecy here about the timing of the birth of Jesus. Jesus had to be born before this took place. Okay. I don't know about y'all. I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, I'm just going to say, like, that's one of those things that I've read over for a long time and never understood the significance of. All right. Uh, let's see. How much, okay. how much time do we normally have? 15 more minutes. 15 more minutes. Mm. Okay. As usual, I have more material than we have time. Okay. Uh, let's see. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12. We'll kind of hit this one real quick. Kind of touch on it. Um, this basically, I'm going to kind of summarize this, but basically we have a promise given to David. Uh, and it says that uh, his, he will, God's going to establish his throne. Uh, where his kingdom is going to be everlasting. Uh, that's kind of what happens here. We see that same kind of concept repeated in First Chronicles 17. Um, the one that the, the one addition that I love about uh, First Chronicles 17, the parallel to that is it says, "I will be a father. Uh, I will be his father." Talking about the descendant of David on the throne, and he will be to me as a son. So that's also a very important thing. Why are we? I want to just kind of transition a little bit um, to make sure we get some of this in. Why are we talking about prophecies? What, what kind of power should these have for our faith? God keeps his promises. Good, yeah. How we know he has authority over everything. There we go, right. This shows us the omniscience of God, right? This is, this is something that should strengthen our faith. I want to give you, I want to kind of uh, talk about prophecy in general, so that you can understand why it's important for us to under, to study and understand these prophecies. Uh, if we, if you were to calculate, okay, we're 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 a Western society. We like numbers, right? So I want to give you some numbers to help you understand the power of prophecy. Okay. Um, I want to go through. These are not necessarily related just to the birth of Jesus, but I want to just. I want to use them as an illustration for some different prophecies. There was a group of secular research scientists, people that don't believe in Jesus, that don't believe in the Bible and all that. And they went through and they calculated some odds for us, okay, for three or four of these prophecies. And I just want to read you what they found. Um, if, when we're talking about the prophecy of Daniel, right, Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 26, where it talks about uh, the Messiah is going to come and he's going to be cut off and all those kinds of things. Okay, that vision that he has there, right? Um, so when we're talking about that, this is about 500 B.C. Daniel proclaimed that this he would begin his uh, public ministry, and he predicted that the Messiah would be cut off and that his place, uh, that that event would take place prior to the second destruction of Jerusalem. And all of those things take place. What do you think the probability is of just anybody being able to fulfill that? Win the lottery. <laughs> yeah, right? Okay. So these secular scientists, they got together and they decided we're going to calculate this out. And they came up with the idea that the probability of the chance of somebody, just any random person, fulfilling that is 1 times 10 to the fifth power. So 1 out of 10 with five zeros behind it. That's a big number. But they get bigger. All right? Um, in 700 B.C., in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, this was one of the ones we were going to get to a little bit later, they ca there's this prophecy that says that the Messiah would be born where? Bethlehem, Bethlehem right? That's one we know. That's a very familiar prophecy. Um, that took place in 700 B.C., right? And they said, what is the chance that this would take place, that this could actually be fulfilled? They came up again with a number of 1 times 10 to the 5th power. That's some pretty significant odds, right? Now, that's by themselves. What if you put them together? Now we're dealing with one person being able to hit, fit both of these. It's one times ten to the tenth power. Hmm. Lottery's looking better and better. A lot better, right? Okay. Here we go. Uh, another prophecy. In the 5th century B.C., a prophet named Zechariah declared that the Messiah would be betrayed for the price of a slave, 30 pieces of silver according to Jewish law, 
that the money would also be used to buy a burial ground for Jerusalem's poor foreigners. That's in Zechariah 11. Uh, the Bible writers and secular historians both record 30 pieces of silver as the sum paid to Judas Iscariot for betraying Jesus. And they indicate that it was used to buy the potter's field, right? That's Matthew chapter 27. They calculated the probability of somebody being able to fulfill that as 1 times 10 to the 11th power. Now I want you to pause and think about the numbers we're at now. 5 and 5 and 21 are 11. That's 21. Okay? All right, here's another one. This is number 4. Some 400 years before the crucifixion, uh, both Israel's uh, King David and the prophet Zechariah described the Messiah's death in words that perfectly depict this mode of execution. They said that the body would be pierced, that none of the bones would be broken, uh, contrary to the customary procedures in cases of crucifixion. And then historians and New Testament writers confirmed this. The chance of that happening and somebody fulfilling that prophecy is 1 in 10 times and 10 to the 13th power. You see where we're going with this. Now we've hit four prophecies, and what number are we at? Yeah, we're at one, one chance out of ten to the thirty-fourth power. You, you, you can buy, you know, that, that's, I'm just saying, like, those are astronomical odds. Like, there's no way. Um, and if you keep going, okay, uh, I'm going to add some, there's a, there were some others that were calculated by the, the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at the Pasadena City College. Uh, Malachi 3.1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. They calculated the odds of this one, and they said, we're going to be very conservative because we are faith-based, and we don't want people to accuse us of bias, so we're going to give really low numbers. At the really low end of this, they said there's one a chance of this, one in ten to the third power. So what's that? One out of a thousand, right? Okay, that somebody would come before the Messiah. Um, then, uh, let's see. Another prophecy, Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, and he is just in having salvation, lowly and riding upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. All right, so then the question is, how many men... Born in Bethlehem, had a forerunner, and entered Jerusalem riding on the colt of a donkey. Right? Again, being very conservative, they calculated the odds of that as one out of a chance in ten to the fourth power. Right? Okay? Another prophecy, Zechariah 13, 6, And he shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? And he shall answer, These are the which I was wounded with the house of my friends. In other words, I was betrayed by a friend. So they said, what is the odds of somebody that uh, was going to be crucified that might be betrayed by one of his friends in order for that to happen? And they calculated that as 1 times 10 to the third power. All right, an, an eighth prophecy. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is his silent, so he opened not his mouth. All right, so after fulfilling the above prophecies, what is the probability? Again, very conservative, low end. They said, we'll do over 10 to the fourth power. Right? You notice how they're keeping these numbers really super low. Right? A ninth prophecy. Uh, For dogs have encompassed me. They, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. That's Psalm twenty-two sixteen. 16. They calculated this one out as 1 and 10 to the fourth power. Now, if you've been doing the math with me, Right? And so most of y'all are like, I haven't. That's that's fine. I did it for you. Right? Where are we at? The probability of taking just these nine prophecies, just nine, if you calculated it out, the chances of somebody fulfilling just these nine is one in ten to the fifty-first power. I want you to think about that. We're dealing with nine. Most people believe that there's some 350 plus prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled. And we're talking about nine. Do you see the power in prophecy? Of understanding just how this book fits together and all the different ways that God was moving and working. 
Let me, let me kind of give you a little bit more maybe of a concept to understand how this works. Uh, in 1943, there was a distinguished French mathematician. Um, his name, I'm probably not going to get this right because I don't speak French, so bear with me. Emile Borel. And he developed a law about probabilities that states events with a sufficiently small probability never occur. Okay? Now, basically what he's saying is any event with, with this, like, you know, honking big number, that's a technical method, a technical term, right? That doesn't happen. It's impossible. Right? Do you know what he calculated out that number to be? Like, if it's above this, forget it, it will never happen. 1 out of 10 to the 50th power. He said, if it hits that, it will never happen. We've only looked at 9 prophecies. And we've already hit that. What does that tell us? It should tell us that our faith stands. Any test that man can throw against it. When we're talking about God bringing our Savior into the world and all the things that he did through Jesus Christ, there is nothing that should take us away from that. And we can rest assured, we can know what our God has done for us. When you think about the, what we're talking about, the fulfillment of just nine prophecies, most of which had very, very conservatively no, low numbers of fulfillment, God is already doing what we have determined to be impossible. Right? Uh, let me give you one last kind of closing illustration uh, for you to think about. There's, there's a, another mathematician. This is a, a believer in Jesus. He, per, he gives us this illustration to help us think about it. He said, I want you to envision silver dollars. All right? And the amount of them is going to be 10 to the 17th power. Now, if you don't know how many that is, you can take the whole entire state of Texas, which if you don't know that is quite large. Okay? Ask them and they'll tell you. They, they like to talk about tea. <laughs> I'll tell you about tea. Sorry. <laughs> All right? But here's the idea, right? You can take the entire state of Texas, cover it in silver dollars two feet deep. You take one of them. You mark it, you throw it in there, and you mix it all up. You take a guy, you put a blindfold on him and say, go get it. And the odds that he has of going through the entire state of Texas two feet deep in silver quarters, or silver half dollars, and finding the one that you marked is 10 to the 17th power. In nine prophecies, we're talking about God doing something that we calculate to be 10 to the 51st power. <clears throat> Our God is amazing. When you really take the time to slow down and understand what he has done. When we really take the time to go through this book and understand the overarching story and how it all fits together and how God has moved and worked and the things that he has brought together. Brothers and sisters, we are blessed beyond measure. Our God has literally done the impossible. Why is that? Because what is impossible with man is possible with God. And that is the foundation of our faith. So many people today doubt. They wonder, how can we know that this is true? Study the prophecies. Study the prophecies of Jesus. Let God and his word speak to you. We, when we really break it down, when we really understand what God has done in the world, we won't doubt. We'll have a faith that's rock solid because it's built on the Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you for your time and attention.